Across the country, both rural and urban land management is constantly adapting to a changing landscape, with energy as an integral part of every infrastructure. On October 15th, the C.T. Bauer College of Business at the University of Houston addressed land management and how it affects the oil and gas industry during the first Distinguished Leaders series of the fall semester with a discussion on land management with special guest Aurora Oil and Gas Limited CEO Douglas E. Brooks. So land professionals are really the business aspect of our business. We have a lot of technical folks that figure out how to get these wells drilled, they figure out why to drill these wells where to drill these wells, and then they set the land professional out to research the, the records in the courthouse. So when you buy or sell a piece of real estate, that, that deed or that transaction will make its way into the local courthouse, and, it, and it's the land professional that go in and dig through that and do all their analysis to determine the ownership. But it doesn't just stop there. Um, once that ownership is determined and companies have f sort of figured out not only what they own, but what their neighbors own, then the land professional is really the one that also steps out and may call an EOG or a Chesapeake or a Marathon or a Cabot or an Anadarko or Apache, some of the co companies I've mentioned here tonight. And they will say, you guys want to do a deal? You know, we've got X number of acres over here. Would you guys like to share some risk? So we'll enter into a series of very complex agreements called JOAs, Joint Operating Agreements. You know, it's kind of the governing document of, the, of, of how the, the, the transaction will take place, who's going to pay what, who's going to do what, and how is it going to, going to work. And then beyond that, once the oil and gas is produced at the surface, you need to do something with that. And oftentimes, land professionals, a natural extension of sort of their commercial mind, some will go into the marketing side of it. Um, some will gravitate toward a, a broader interest in the, in the industry and become a CEO. I think to truly be successful in, in any enterprise today is that if you're going to choose a very narrow view of what it is you're going to do in, in the industry you select, um, you're going to have a great rewarding career. But if you really want to broaden, pay attention to the others that you work with, pay attention to um, the things that interest you, and, and you'll gravitate towards success. And, and really, that old saying of, you know, as long as I'm doing what I want to do, doesn't, it means I'm not really going to work. Um, I get up every day and I can't wait to get to work. So um, Aurora Oil and Gas now, we produce about 15,000 barrels of oil equivalent a day net, which means net to our interest. We're the fifth largest Australian oil company. But what we've attempted to do in the U.S. market in, in terms of Houston has become much more visible um, through a transaction we made in March. As I mentioned, Marathon was our primary and only operator of, a, of one asset. In, in what's called the sugarcane field. So part of the strategic process, we were deciding that, you know, we really do want to be an operator. Remember, we didn't agree to the, the uh, strategy until May. But in March, just like life, life gets in the way of living, I think John Lennon said. Quite a guy. And he, uh, he said, you know, life gets in the way of living. So just about the time it was the least convenient to do a deal, because I really hadn't gotten the board on, on, uh, on board yet, to make an acquisition, a great acquisition came along. And, and so in March, we became an operator. Um, it's what I call a 10 percenter. It increased our rate, our net rate, our production, reserves, and land position by 10 percent. Well, that's not a transformational move, but the transformational piece is that we're now an operator. Very pleased with the work, um, but it's an integrated effort. The land department was part of the due diligence effort to make sure that the seller owned what they said they did um, it wasn't really too tough a title, but we put our title buster on it, and she said it looks to be cl pretty clean, so I was high confidence in that. And so, really, Aurora continues to transform and evolve uh, into what I think is going to be a more and better named E&P firm uh, that most of you will hear about in Houston over the next number of years. So it's a very unique story. It's a very interesting story. It's an entrepreneurial story. And believe me, as I talk to the board and I talk to, to some of the founders, um, it sounds like it was, oh, well, came to the U.S., took a deal, drilled some wells, it all worked out, now you're worth $2 billion. Well, it's never that easy. I mean, there were a lot of bumps in the road. There were a lot of sleepless nights. There were well costs that went way over estimate. Um, there were days when people really weren't sure what was going to happen. But life's lessons for me is perseverance. You don't give up. If it doesn't work, you find your way around it. If you haven't found your way around it, you keep working. You know, someone once said to me, you know, it all works out in the end. You've heard that, 
Everybody's heard of that one. The better one was, if it hasn't worked out, it's not the end. So don't give up.